ECDC On Air, the podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello, my name is Nicholas and I'm your host for today's episode of ECDC On Air, which is the podcast for the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Today I have with me in the studio Andrea Amon, who is the General Director for ECDC. Thanks for taking the time to be with us on ECDC on air, Andrea. Nice to have you here. Good afternoon. Today you will be talking to us about ECDC's new expanded mandate and the new regulation on serious cross-border threats to health. These are two regulations that will have a significant impact on the way that ECDC works and also the way that Europe responds to health threats. So maybe we should start off just looking at the COVID-19 pandemic. Would you say that this was a trigger for the reinforced mandate and the new regulation on serious cross-border threats to health? It was definitely a trigger for this whole legislative package because it encompasses the lessons that we learned in the first year of uh, this pandemic. These first months showed us that in the end, we were not so prepared as we thought. And that is uh, true for almost everybody. All countries, the EU level, I think we all found elements that we could uh, improve. And these legal proposals incorporate these early lessons learned. Can you then explain a little bit? I've heard mention of the European Health Union. Can you explain a bit more what that is? Yes, the European Health Union is a package of four legislative proposals that um, entail a new amended mandate for the European Medicines Agency, for the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, the ECDC, but also a new regulation for serious cross-border threats to health and a council regulation on countermeasures in the case of a health emergency in the EU. And uh, out of these components in the European Health Union, which ones are the most important then for ECDC? We have links to all four, um, of course, but uh, very central for us are the ECDC regulation per se. And very interlinked to it is the regulation on serious cross-border health threats. So there are many references in both of those regulations to the other one. So we have to basically see both of these regulations in parallel in order to understand what the new work entails. Okay. So maybe if we start off by looking a bit more in detail at the ECDC's expanded mandate, I think there are some very interesting points concerning surveillance, first of all, and how digital platforms and solutions can improve the sharing of data between countries. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, the lesson that we learned here was that our current surveillance systems are too cumbersome. They require too much input from experts that, as we have seen in the pandemic, um, had to do a lot of other things like case finding, contract tracing, monitoring, and so forth. And at the end of the day, they had to then also do the reporting. So the idea is to establish a surveillance system that makes use of digital solutions that bridge those steps where so far human input is necessary and reserves the need for human input at those steps where it is necessary for the interpretation and the validation for some of the steps. Okay, so I understand then that's a kind of way to save time for people uh, and uh, I guess also reducing workload and making things faster and easier to share the data between countries. Exactly. The aim is not only to relieve the workload. The legal proposal speaks of real-time data. So I would rather say for timely data, uh, for more complete data and more comparable data in the end. And the idea is that data that are included, for instance, in electronic health records are then used for the surveillance and transported 
to a national database, for instance, and from there automatically transport it to ECDC. That is uh, something that is easily said, but is a big chunk of work where both we in ECDC, but also the member states will have uh, to give their contributions and input. Another element that is important in this context uh, that is new now in the legislation are the European reference laboratories. And they are also coming out of a lesson that we have learned uh, during the pandemic that there is in the uh, area of public health not an equivalent to what uh, the veterinary area already has with the European reference laboratories that could take on, for instance, the validation of new tests. So during the pandemic, everybody, uh, every country had to validate the tests that came new to the market themselves. That is something that could be done by these uh, reference laboratories. Also training, providing reference material and these kind of things. So here is really a very concrete lesson that will be taken up. These reference laboratories will be appointed and financed by the European Commission and will be coordinated in their scientific and technical work by us, by ECDC. So here we are already in contact with uh, the European Commission DigiSante and with our uh, member states, what would be pathogens or a family of pathogens where such European reference laboratories would be useful. And uh, it's also about looking into the future, right? The idea is, and what we have also seen in the past three years, that the surveillance data that are more retrospective, capturing what has already happened, should be complemented by a forecasting look. And uh, these forecasts have to have different time frames. So we need an immediate forecast uh, for a few weeks, then a more bit longer forecast for a few months. And then foresight, we understand as a project that looks really far ahead into scenarios as how the world could look like in 2040, so 20, 10, 20 years ahead. With the idea that when we have different scenarios, how the world could be in this period, based on drivers that we see already now, that we can say, okay, if we then go backwards to today, what do we need to do today in order to either prevent or at least have a positive influence on these scenarios in the future? And ECDC's extended mandate also has important implications for preparedness and prevention. Can you tell us more about that? That is also a very complex piece of work because it has many different components. It has the component of supporting the member states in reviewing their preparedness plans, in identifying gaps, in supporting them to close these gaps but also supporting the uh, Commission in establishing a European preparedness plan. And that is one part. The other part is that there will be a regular reporting from the member states on parameters that can characterize and give information on the current state of their preparedness plans. ECDC has the task then to visit all the countries every three years and give recommendations that countries could take up and uh, come up with action plans where we can support them in their implementation of these action plans. And then uh, the cycle of reporting starts again with the idea that over time, of course, the level of preparedness um, improves. There's also the proposal to have an EU health task force. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, this EU Health Task Force is a new element that should be a pool of trained people composed of experts from ECDC, but also from the member states and uh, from our uh, fellowship programs that would be available at request to support member states in crisis or outbreak situations, but also to support them in their preparedness improvements. And uh, not only in the EU, but could be also requested from outside uh, the EU from third countries. 
And uh, international collaboration, obviously that's when it comes to disease prevention and control, something that is important. Can you tell us more about how the extended mandate will strengthen international collaboration? We have already acted outside the EU uh, before the new mandate came into force. But now in the amended mandate, it is much more emphasized that we should have a global outreach. We will, of course, start with our immediate or continue with our immediate neighborhood, like the Western Balkan countries and Turkey, the European neighborhood policy partner countries around the Black Sea, around the Mediterranean, but then also continue our work and collaboration with the CDCs around the world. And there, our focus right now is uh, Africa, the Africa CDC, but also with the US CDC, with China, with Canada. And recently, we have also signed collaboration agreements with uh, Mexico, with uh, South Korea, and are in contact with other countries to strengthen the collaboration. What about ECDC's role in terms of vaccines? Yes, that uh, has been also recognized as an important element, especially in the prevention. And uh, that is now formalizing also things that we have requested since some years in terms of a monitoring platform for vaccine safety and effectiveness that we will post jointly with the medicines agency, where the medicines agency will predominantly work on safety monitoring and ECDC will predominantly work on the effectiveness monitoring of vaccines. And of course, the starting point now are the COVID uh, vaccines, but step by step, we want to include also other vaccines. And if we move on then to look at the second legislative act that will have a big impact on ECDC, new regulation on serious cross-border threats to health. It's quite extensive. I've looked at it, it encompasses many different aspects. And I know it can be hard to summarize something which is as long as that is, but uh, maybe in a, in a short few words, if you could at least uh, give it a try. Yeah, um, I'm sure I leave out several elements of it when I, when I do this now. But the serious cross-border health threat regulation is sort of an overarching regulation that determines a bit the, the governance of such crisis situations. So it establishes not only that there is a health security committee, but a new level of the health security committee that should look at more strategic and policy elements, whereas the health security committee, as it has been in place, is looking at the, the technical scientific aspects more. And this health security committee will be formulating opinions that can then be used by the countries as basis for their decision making. We have, of course, all the prerequisites uh, that I mentioned before in terms of preparedness, most of them in terms of the preparedness reporting, monitoring, the regular visits, that is part of this uh, regulation. It does advocate a One Health approach. It's definitely wider than ECDC's remit on infectious diseases. It's a more all hazard approach and um, has many other elements that maybe are too many for now. Okay. How does this act affect the work of ECDC directly? Well, it um, will, of course, give our work for surveillance and preparedness a specific focus. I think overall, in order to succeed, we in ECDC will have to look at and change, in my view, how we interact with the countries. We have so far a bit, I mean, we have a regular interaction via our disease and public health function networks with the annual meetings of the national focal points, the daily interaction with operational contact points. However, I feel that now we need also something more, uh, more interactive, something more dynamic, where there is more dialogue and from our side, more time invested in listening to the needs of the countries so that we can in the end tailor our still non-binding, but our recommendations, our guidance, our advice more to the needs of uh, the, the, the countries. We have practiced such an approach in the last two years already 
for uh, instance, when we approached countries with uh, vaccine coverage for COVID vaccines that was below the EU average, where we talked first bilaterally with, I think, 11 countries. And um, after having talked to all of them, had basically a catalog of needs, some of which were individual to specific countries, but some of which were also common for all the countries. So we could there tailor our advice, our guidance documents, either specifically to one country, that was not only the guidance documents, but also the specific actions that we took. For instance, one country said it's the GPs that are in need of getting more information on the safety of these vaccines. And so we made a seminar for GPs in their own language so that there was no language barrier. And um, other things like dealing with misinformation, that was common to all of the countries. So we have developed now a, a training for frontline public health professionals, how to deal with misinformation when they meet, for instance, parents or other potential vaccinees that came with ideas that they have read somewhere so that they can deal with this because they themselves have the information that is necessary for that. If we look at uh, both the extended mandate and this new regulation, is there an implementation time for this? Well, everybody wants to have that uh, as soon as possible. Now, there will be, of course, things that can be implemented faster. Actually, some of the things are already established, like this uh, joint vaccination monitoring platform for safety and uh, effectiveness of vaccines. EMA and ECDC have kicked off this platform in December. Then there is what we haven't mentioned so far, also a requirement for ECDC to establish a network on substances of human origin to enhance the microbiological safety of these substances. That network has also been started already in December last year. There will be other elements that require the commission to um, make implementing acts before we can actually start working. And uh, so we are working now with DG Santé on giving input in such uh, implementing acts. So that some of them will happen this year and some of them will happen next year. But the big chunks that I mentioned at the beginning, the surveillance digitalization, all the preparedness work, that will take probably several years to really take off and then come to a regular cycle. Of course, the first survey will be done this year for the preparedness. So we will have uh, by the end of the year a first baseline where countries are. But the whole improvement work will only start then. And well, it depends on how much, as I said, also the countries can invest in this and are willing to invest in this, how quickly this will go forward. And how is this being funded? There are uh, different funding sources. Part is, of course, a part of our budget. But it's very clear there, uh, especially for the digitalization of surveillance, uh, enormous investments need to be made. And there also the commission can um, and is willing to chip in with some extra funding. But of course, some of the funding will also have to come from the member states. And finally, if we look at the improvement to or ensuring a healthy Europe, which is ultimately what the ECDC is working for, what concrete sort of improvements would you see with this in terms of ensuring people's health? If you operate under the idea that you need to have uh, first really uh, good, solid data, then um, I think uh, all these efforts in getting data more timely in a more comparable way and more complete also from different data sources, which is another stream of work that will be pursued then uh, there is uh, already a good basis. But of course, based on that, actions have to be taken. Actions in terms of translating the analysis of this data into public health action, into uh, concrete proposals, what countries can do in order to uh, improve the situation for certain parts of the population or for the whole population. I think it's a good basis. But it all will depend on how much we actually can move forward.
Thank you, Andrea. That was all the questions that I had for you this time. So thanks for being with us here on ECDC On Air once again. It was my pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this episode of ECDC On Air. For more information about ECDC and its work, please visit us on the web at ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media.